So at Ratio Christi, of course, we defend Christian truth claims using evidence from philosophy, science, and history. Sometimes we discuss very debatable um, topics. And, oh, I need to go back to what that is. Let's see. Yeah. Um, we like to give you a landscape of views that are on the table, ones we might not even agree with, but it gives, we like to give you the tools to critique them for yourself. So tonight, we're doing something completely different, um, deconstructing transhumanism. And by deconstruction, we just mean tonight to examine or critique. And there's different kinds of tr critiques of transhumanism. The most common is a technological critique, which, which uh, examines their predictions about whether the technology is plausible. There's theological critiques because transhumanism makes quasi-religious claims, and we kind of talked about um, that kind of critique last semester. Uh, tonight, we're going to do a philosophical critique, and I think it gives us the most bang for our buck because it focuses on the philosophical assumptions that transhumanists have about human persons. So transhumanists assume a materialist or mechanistic philosophy of mind and human persons. In other words, you're just your physical body and brain. There's no soul, there's no afterlife. So I argue that the current obstacles transhumanists face in achieving their goals won't be overcome, but this isn't due to any deficiency in technology, but it's they, it's because their assumed philosophy of mind and human persons is inadequate and false. In other words, they face more of a philosophical problem than a techno, techno, technological problem. But one thing to remember, here's, here's Alvin and Carol, is that we, we, we can have common ground with transhumanism because we're answering the same questions. What is the problem with the human condition? What is the solution? And how can we overcome death and have eternal life? C.S. Lewis said, the man who agrees with us that some question is of great importance can be our friend. He need not agree with us about the answer. So let's just start with a brief overview because you guys have slept since, um, since last semester when we covered it. Transhumanists believe science and technology, this is broadly, will solve humanity's problems. And humanity's chief problems originate from our naturalistic evolutionary heritage. That means we have limited intelligence, limited biology, and even limited emotions. By applying science and technology to human persons, trans transhumanists say we will overcome these limits to become a new species of posthumans. And transhumanists envision a posthuman triple S techno utopia of super intelligence, super longevity, and super happiness. And you can think of the transhumanist aim is like the double blur, the gradual blurring of traditional boundaries between human persons and machines. On the one hand, in the, A in the AI field, they want to build machines to be persons, that is, AGI or human level intelligence that will then surpass human intelligence and then that computer will become a super intelligence and at the very same time they want to transform human persons into machines through artificial technological enha enhancements. So but how are they going to propose to get there? Well first of all transhumanists are fully committed to carrying to completion the materialist picture of reality to include human persons. On this view, humans are merely complex matter arranged according to the impersonal laws of physics. As Jerry Fodor says, physics determines chemistry, chemistry de determines biology, biology determines brain science, and brain science determines mental states. So transhumanists propose to manipulate and engineer humans to transcend our biology by merging with technology. And then ultimately, we can rid ourselves of biology to become post-human by uploading our brain patterns to a machine. And we could have digital immortality in this world until the heat death of the universe. How do we know that it smells nice in computers? How, how do we know what? That it smells nice in computers. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> have you ever smelled your computer? I don't know. I, that's a funny thing. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> 
It's a machine no, smell. Oh, the smell. What was that from? The smell. Oh, that's from the Matrix, right? Okay, anyway. So the trajectory of enhancements, it will come in stages, and it follows the emerging technologies that we have. And of course, aside from AI, which we already discussed, that's, that's a given. They're already working on AGI. The other technology that's, that's coming along quite quickly is biotechnology. And we're talking about things like, I'm sure you've heard of CRISPR, Cas9, gene editing. Uh, we're talking about stem cell therapy, therapeutic cloning, embryo selection, synthetic biology, and germline gene editing, which is, affects your offspring, right? So let's just envision, so a baby is born in the not too distant future, his name's Bob. Here he is, do you see him? This is little baby Bob. Isn't he cute? Okay. <laughs> he was designed by genetic engineering through embryo selection and germline engineering. And that means his offspring also will share his genetic enhancements. So Bob will, Bob will be designed with no genetic diseases or biological flaws. And you can see that his parents probably have designed him to excel at powerlifting. <laughs> You'd like that? <laughs> okay, I don't have a later picture of him, but here he's doing quite well. Um, <laughs> you have to note that every the, the technologies that, were, that are emerging first will be used for therapeutic healing. That just means to bring a human person to normal function. So first, they're going to do all kinds of amazing things for us, right? Therapeutic healing. But transhumanists will then use those same technologies for human enhancement to go beyond the, the norm or the normal function. Okay, the next big one, you've heard of nanotechnology? Anybody, does anybody uh, have work in that field? You sort of, okay. And so, of course, James Tour, really, James Tour at Rice is big in, he's like a innovator in nanotechnology. Um, it means constructing objects, and correct me if I'm wrong, because I'm no nanotechnologist, but constructing objects with atomic scale control, and in, our, in this case, computer-driven machines the size of molecules. Deetsy, weetsy, you know, microscopic, right? So Bob, when he gets older, he, he opts to enhance himself with nanobot therapy for anti-aging, which replaces his cells with synthetic biology instead of his regular cells. And replacing, and this is the most important part for transhumanists, replacing his brain neurons with synthetic nanobots. And this connects Bob directly to the internet, first of all, and then through brain-machine interface, which I would say all the major tech is working on brain-machine interfaces. Um, he's, he will then be connected to what's called the global brain, or like a collective consciousness of people. And I kind of always think of the Borg. Is anybody Star Trek? You know, <laughs> resistance is futile, you know. Um, there's Picard under the influence of the Borg. Um, and then not only that, eventually, Bob will ultimately merge with the new superintelligence, okay? And then after many years as a cyborg, Bob, what is left of Bob's biological body finally wears out. So he undergoes this process. Now, now by, by now, the superintelligence is active and can help with this process of scanning his brain pattern to upload himself to a computer. So he can survive either disembodied or downloaded in a robot until the heat death of the universe. The other thing that they think is a perk is that he can have many copies of himself. So bot, right? So it's gonna have a little bit of wonkiness when we talk about identity. But so they claim that you can just have all these backup copies of yourself. So the last stage is the ones that are blue on the journey to becoming post-human, actually they admit 
that they depend on the success of AGI, artificial general intelligence, and then on, super intel on the superintelligence who will help humans scan their brain pattern up, upload to a computer. So that's why we're going to focus on, on whether AGI is possible. So we're going to answer two questions. Is AGI metaphysically possible? And we're going to, um, we're going to make an argument against the computational theory of mind. And then, is the future you really you? And we're going to um, talk about an arg arguments against the patternist view of the self. OK, we can, are we good so far? OK. So the computational theory of mind is the, the grounding for AGI, how they, how they think of, of uh, reaching AGI. And all it is is the idea that thinking, human thinking, and computing are the same. Mind is to brain just as the program is to the computer. So some of our reasoning, specifically mathematical proofs, deductive logic, can be reduced to computation. And that's like classic AI, classical AI. However, the boundaries of human thought extend beyond computability. Intelligence is much more than just deductive logic and even induction, which is modern AI. Most thinking is non-computational, things like Imagination, creativity, counterfactual reasoning, answering what if questions, scientific hypothesizing, answering why, how questions, common sense reasoning, and reasoning involved in um, criminal investigations. So the most important type of non-computational thinking is abductive reasoning. And we constantly reason throughout the day using abductive inference. Um, what it does, abduction starts with a particular fact or observation. Often it's a surprising fact or an exception. And then we draw a relevant conclusion or a particular plausible explanation from it. So abduction requires understanding the meaning of clues in the real world in their context and drawing relevant conclusions from our background, all of our background knowledge. So, for example, on a Saturday, my driveway is wet, but it is not raining and it hasn't been raining. Hmm. So I reason to myself that the boys next door often play with super soaker water guns all up and down the street on Saturdays. So I think, I conclude that the boys have made my driveway wet. Okay, here's another one. So remember, it, and it can be proven wrong. It's defeasible. You can get new information in it and you can change your conclusion. A girl with blonde hair was seen outside her dorm on Monday night while enjoying the tornado winds and, and hail. All other students had taken cover inside from the warning. And they didn't name her. And I'm going, I wonder, who could that be? Who, who could it be? Did, what do you abduct? Uh, it's Bruin! <laughs> I'm guessing the girl they're naming in the report is none other than our Bruin. That's because I, I, I had b background information and I, it was in the con, right? Okay, you get it? So deduction is classic AI, and it confirms or makes knowledge explicit. You know what a deductive logical argument is. If it's raining, the streets are wet. It's raining, therefore the streets are wet. It's that kind of boring type of logic. Induction is like more like modern AI, and it's looking, it captures regularities or patterns in controlled environments, environments, but it's not always reliable. So it would be something like, when Susan took her umbrella to work this week, it rained those days. So the conclusion, it's a generalized from specific. Every time Susan takes her umbrella to work, it will rain. So it's not, it, it could be wrong, right? So it's not always reliable in the real world. Uh-huh. I'm just curious with this 
if you relate it to like um, going forward, if the idea is to make the technology have the same kind of intelligence that we're currently at, how do we know that, that intelligence is somehow superior if it could have these same faults? Um, well, so I'm not saying that the conclusion is always right, but it is defeasible and you can get to new knowledge. No, I, I'm curious if like the transhumanists would have a response to that because it, it seems like if you're trying to bring uh, technology up to our levels and this is inherently how you have to go about this is a pro This is a huge problem. Okay. Yeah. This is like a recalcitrant obstacle that they've been working on for years. And I won't go into detail. If you really want to read about it, I was telling Ben, the book to get that, where he talks in detail, and he's an AGI researcher, is Eric J. Larson's book, The Myth of Artificial Intelligence. And he goes into, he was actually part of the DARPA program to use big data to download big data to computers so that they would have all this background information like we have as, as humans. The problem is they don't have the discernment or judgment to pick out the rel what's relevant. And we're, we're fixing to find out why. So even, even though um, you could say a computer is understanding deductive logic because it can be reduced to computation, the computer doesn't understand deductive logic. It's programmed, okay? But let, all, the, all this to say that model, and, and what they've done with classic AI and modern AI is absolutely wonderful. And what I think the, the good thing is the research project should be how much of human intelligence can be reduced to computation. That should be a research project, right? And that's what they've done. But I'm just telling you that there's recalcitrant obstacles at play that aren't because of the technology. They're because of the philosophy of human persons. But anyway, um, uh, so I think what they've done is rep they've, they are able to represent a special kind of reasoning on the computer, right? But to overgeneralize the concept of computability to include all reasoning, it just trivializes the nature of cognition. So to best illustrate this, and this is on your handout on the back, Charles Peirce, uh, he was a late 1800s American philosopher, and he developed the theory of semiotics. So this, I think, best illustrates what, we're, what they're up against, okay? So on the, the first diagram, you have human mental cognition, is a sign using system. So what, what Peirce said was, human minds are sign using systems involving a triadic relation between a sign, what it stands for, and a sign user. The diagram illustrates the semiotic transmission of information. There's first of all, a relation of causation between sign S and what it stands for X. And then, I'm sorry, relation of causation between sign S and sign user Z, sorry. Then secondly, a relation of grounding between the sign and what it stands for, X. And then third, a relation of interpretation when the sign user Z interprets the relation between sign S and what it stands for, X. So let's just do an example. So a stop sign stands for come to a halt. A sign user interpret interprets the relation between the stop sign and the meaning come to a halt, which brings about a mental disposition to slow down and come to a complete stop before proceeding through the intersection. Y'all do that, right? <laughs> Sam. <laughs> and if you don't, you could get pulled over. And it's a big fine, right? Yeah. I got a warning. You got a warning for going through a stop sign? Some people get Oh man, I would cry. I would cry. They still give me a ticket. Okay. <laughs> the meaning of the sign is evident in the interpretation that it generates in the sign user. So cognition occurs as a consequence of the causal interaction between the sign, what it stands for, and the sign user. Okay? Now go to diagram two. I didn't say, isn't he handsome though? What do you think about his beard? 
It's not very full though, right? It's not very full. It's kind of, kind of. I'm just looking at the side of his head because like, I understand he has this little like thing going on up here. Yeah. But then he has another like cowlick going on out here. But it is his own hair. It's his own hair. Yeah. But but for an 18 year old guy, Yeah. Yeah. He reminds me of somebody. I can't remember who he reminds me of. What? In the 1800s. We're just continuing to talk about this. <laughs> so let's look at the second diagram, which is the computer physical symbol system. The missing piece that you can see in machine processing is the grounding of the sign's meaning for the computer. Immanuel Kant and C.S. Lewis argued there must be a grounding for acts of understanding. It's what they call taking as or seeing as. You're understanding the sign. And the computer lacks this understanding and judgment about the symbol and its related meaning. Computers manipulate symbols following the steps of a program or algorithm. These symbols have a causal effect and, and an output, but the symbols don't stand for anything for the computer itself. Even if there's an interpreted formal system that provides meaning to the marks, the marks are meaningful for the programmers of the computer, not meaningful for use by the computer. So, okay. I'm thinking about like a car driving AI or something along Oh, right, right. So what I'm saying is semantics, the meaning, is not intrinsic to the symbols or syntax. So computers are not sign using, so they don't have first purchase, first-person conscious reasoning to understand the meaning of the symbol. They can have inputs and outputs, but they, there's no grounding for the computer to understand the meaning. In fact, in physics, according to John Searle, there's not an inherent syntax in physics. That's also applied by the programmer. The grounding means the computer has no first-person reasoning to understand the meaning of the symbol or the sign. I mean, like, if it sees, like, a, another car or a bicycle moving this way, it's like, oh, I should slow down to let them pass me. That then, seems to be, like, reasoning. Yes. Meaning. Yeah. So and it can sense. appear. And so it can appear. I, it has inputs and outputs. But, but no connection between the input and the outputs. There's no That's, grounding. <laughs> it's... Yeah. There is a definitely a connection between the input and the output. I'm just going to go into example because in self-driving cars, there's actually an element called the ground fruit um, that is used when um, programming these things. Um, that effectively, this, this means um, a car um, follows its program, it does what it's supposed to do according to its program, and then it hits another vehicle. But the fact of the matter is, it hit another vehicle. Regardless of how, you know, regardless of even if it were, um, you know, the perfectly following the program. And it, the issue is that the program itself doesn't understand that hitting another vehicle was wrong in that case. Like, it's not a bad data point necessarily. It just means that uh, it's not like, um, oh, here's a brand new data point. It's like, oh, I, I hit another vehicle, but I did what I was supposed to do. Um, so you always have to compare what the program means to the ground truth of reality. Um, I mean, people hit cars. I, I, I guess what you're saying is that car, car AIs aren't uh, intelligent. Well, right. That's right. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Exactly yeah. right. <laughs> yeah. But like they, like humans crash as well. But, but humans that's true. Crash, they don't say, "Oh, I'm fine." <laughs> like they. They don't say, I did what I was supposed to be doing. I mean, Sam, do you want to clarify just about the about a program being for use by the program? Just offer another example. I'm sorry, but yeah, I was just going to offer another example from the ground. We were talking earlier about raining, you know, oh, the street is wet, therefore it's probably raining. You know, if we receive some information like, oh, the street is wet, then we go and we say, oh, it's probably raining, because we intrinsically understand that when it rains, the ground gets wet, and that that's Generally. Well, a computer could be programmed for that too, but it but it would be the exceptions that it couldn't. Yeah. So you know, if you're doing a computer, it's pretty rare that the computer would understand. 
understand, oh, this is why this is true. This is why, you know, the ground is wet implies rain. But it's, it's just here. saying that it's learning over time in the same way that you had to learn that when that the ground yeah. got wet because it rained, because you saw it when you were a kid. Oh, the no, well, was wet. imagine this. Imagine if you're a kid and you notice the ground is wet and you ask your parents, hey, why is the ground wet? And your parents tell you, oh, it's because it rained earlier. Yes. And then any time you ever notice that the ground is wet, you have to keep asking. You have to keep going through the same routine in order to come to a conclusion. So the, I, the, the, let me, let me do it in other words and see if this helps, Daniel. A machine doesn't have first person conscious reasoning or understanding of the meaning of symbols in a program. You don't know the amount of times it crashes because it doesn't know the variables. Or I mean, it's a, yeah. a program. So that, think about this way. This, we're talking about. Uh, imagine you're in a room, mm -hmm. and there's a little slot on the door, and somebody passes you. In the Chinese, what you want to call it? Yeah, right? this, this is like the precursor to the Chinese room. Yeah, somebody can pass you symbols, and your behavior can depend on those symbols. That doesn't mean that you'll ever know what the symbols mean. You may correlate those symbols with I some other thing. That, that nerves do that. Hmm? And so, because a nerve is taking inputs from other nerves, right? But it doesn't know what those inputs mean. No, but you do. Computation. Yeah, I there's like, a so. How? So I, I think I can't yeah. see inside my own. Well, I, I we don't have to describe why you are able to know and understand meaning I, I would to recognize that, that you do. Output from the Chinese machine. You ask, what am I thinking? And I'm like. Oh, I'll look at the history of what I've been doing, uh, reference that to other things in the Chinese room, like put it together and then send that out. But do you know what that means? No, because I'm the nerd. So why, how do you know that that doesn't so correspond with what she, how do you know that you disagree with her? What do you mean? I think you said you didn't know what anything no, that I'm you just said. I from the perspective, like I'm comparing nerves to programs. Right, or to like very okay. basic. They're not actually, they're, they're, mm -hmm. this is a comparison of mental processes, thinking and cognition to programs. So it's not about neurons to programs. I think, I think what, I think what it, he's trying to say, I, I think I might, I might have an understanding with the, uh, of this, is the program or the way that we're currently the level and extent of how our programs are running and the way they're functioning is less akin to a interconnected human mind and closer to a handful of neurons. And like this is exemplified in some uh, different program stuff like neural networks. And right. How they function. And that that's mainly induction. Right. Right. And so well what he's saying, what I what I think I'm kind of thinking about this is it seems like what we're doing is um, Neural networks are only like a handful of neurons, and the main difficulty we have right now is having enough neurons and enough context and information that can be compiled and enough time to understand it to build up to that kind of uh, abductive thinking. That to well, me, you, so why? You never go from. You're never going to change the mode of logic. So, yeah, you can't yeah. scale. That's so that's might, what this is, and, and that's what they have found. That's what they tried to do. Well, right. That's what I'm saying. Is that that's not that's only something that's really with neural networks. So there's a. That, I'm trying to I figure out how to describe. I think we're asking questions that are going to be addressed. Like, not Potentially, just, yeah. I, I, so I think we should try to go through, and then we can continue this. Yeah, we can we can continue this later. Well, I like later. the clarification because this one this is actually very important, um, and you can disagree, but I would say that because of these recalcitrant obstacles, that machines won't become conscious beings with minds. Right. Okay, so you think and, that we won't find a solution? Right. And so you can, you can disagree and say, well, humans don't even have consciousness. Then Daniel Dennett and Churchland would say that, right? They would just say consciousness is, is I, an illusion. Well, but, I, would, yeah. um, I think I would say is, I, and that's probably what this next part is going to be, is why would consciousness not be a, uh, 
uh, emergent property that would come about from yeah. a bunch of deductive things. And so it deductive just seems things. like you get you can get the most complicated matter you can get and don't think you're going to emerge have consciousness. So so why don't or yeah, I guess that's the, that's what this next probably this next stuff that we're talking about is is uh, what reason do we have to not consider consciousness as like an emergent property? Of well, I don't really get into that, but um, That one might be something we get into next week. Okay. All right? Okay. Yep. Um, we have good reasons to think, I think, that transhumanists will not achieve AGI. Okay. Um, there's eight other, there's, um, and so if they don't achieve AGI, there's not going to be a superintelligence. So that's a problem, and and actually they do say they depend on these two things. Okay. This is where I'm curious. Like, okay, let's assume for some moment that they can go past it and achieve AGI. I, I don't see foundationally, if you skip that gap over to abductive reasoning, why you should then trust the reasoning of the system that got you there and define it as super intelligence. Are you merely trusting? They're just saying it if it's human level intelligence, it can it can start perfecting itself to become a super intelligence. So effectively but, we're just trying to get it up to human level and then once it gets to human level it will it's surpass. Like, well, why, it's why not going it, to automatically it surpass. Assumed to surpass. It's not, it going, would, to auto, it's not going to yeah. automatically surpass it, right? We're gonna to get to like human level ish and then we'll innovate and or or it was supposed if, to innovate if, if it's possible for a computer yeah. to produce human level intelligence you can always make a bigger computer exactly know, but why does but that necessarily a, equate to that well, doesn't necessarily the, the equate to so if we manage to reproduce okay. a human and or like a human level intelligence as a computer we can always scale it up give it more memory make it process faster yeah. so effectively it's what we're doing is making a human that thinks Several times yeah. faster with right. a lot exactly. of data, yeah. which is sure. superhuman. Yeah, so you, we could, you wouldn't actually know whether or not that conclusion was true because it's now based on abductive reasoning, and you would have to personally to actually know that's true, have the same experience as a computer. I mean, we just asked the what if to we built a computer, it, a massive, massive so, computer, to try and figure out what the meaning. <laughs> To life, to universe, and everything. Oh, have you ever read Isaac Asimov's The Last Question? And then, so we built that computer and we let it process for like 500 years, and then that computer told us to build another computer. <laughs> then we built that computer, <laughs> and then that computer told us that the answer to life, the universe, and everything was 42. What about, what, would that? Have you, have you ever read The Last Question? No. No? I, uh, highly, I highly recommend it. Has anyone? Yeah. Isaac Asimov? We should do it sometime. Let's talk about it. Okay, so there's other arguments to make the case. This isn't the only one. I just like it because I like that old guy, and I think it's a precursor to the Chinese room. It's like the foundational um, philosophy uh, that supports John Searle's Chinese room. But there's other arguments you could use. Um, okay, and I. I must say, I would like your questions to be in the voice of Squidward or Spongebob. Patrick? Or Patrick. Ben? No? I could do that. Sure you can! No? I didn't watch Spongebob. Oh! What? He said shut up in this room. I don't watch Spongebob. Okay, what? Okay, you don't have to use Spongebob. On the last slide, I was just wondering how Nagel's argument about uh, what it's like to be a bat because yeah, it's about consciousness defeat, so it defeats it because because the, because a machine doesn't have a first person consciousness okay. right could you just say that there is something that's like to be a computer like i mean I've, for itself for itself yeah i'm just wondering how that argument by itself would uh, it's not i think that's why you have a collection right. but yeah that's why you have a, a kind of a cumulative case yeah yeah, okay. yeah. So I have a question. What? If atheism is true, is the uh, the proposal of transhumanism reasonable? Well, or maybe even more specifically, if materialism. Is yeah, true. yeah. So to to let you know that this is not just outlandish, this pro program pro project, these three projects they're doing are very important to a materialist. Because if it can be true that 
we could merge with technology, transcend our biology, and so forth. It would mean materialism is true, right? It it's a way of confirming the materialist view of the human person. So this project actually, all eyes are on neuroscience and transhumanism to see if this can happen. So anyway. Yeah, I feel like uh, if, even if we develop like human intelligence AIs, people are just going to say like they have souls now, for example. So I feel like it won't like prove it 100%. But you mean the computer is going to become a theist? No. I'm so the, the, the computer would be a, a I dualist. Think he's, I think what he's saying is dualist. that while a failure to while a failure due to lacking a, the key component that would come from a non-materialistic worldview. Uh, would prevent this thing from succeeding, which the, these projects would demonstrate. Mm -hmm. uh, having these projects succeed doesn't necessarily mean a materialistic worldview is correct, yeah. because there could be other factors like uh, they become suitable hosts for souls or some other yeah. concept that could theoretically but occur. But just to let you know, it, it is important. It's not just totally yeah, wonky. It is important. It is important, and people are follow it. People mm -hmm. follow it, yeah. right? Because it's a, you know, um, the Higgs boson was predicted before it was ever found, right? Mm -hmm. And it was predicted because they, they figured out that it could be true before it actually became, in, you know, they found it, right? You know, a real thing. So sometimes that happens in science. There's a prediction that it can be based on the philosophy and then it becomes a reality. And so I think that this is, um, this is, this is a lot of what's going on. Yeah. So, so this question number two is, is the future you really you? So transhumanists claim that radical enhancements and mind uploading are beneficial and good for you, for yourself. I mean, your decision to enhance, that they want to persuade you to enhance, is the promise that it will improve you, that you will overcome old age and death and suffering. So transhumanists hold what's called a patternist view of personal identity. And what that means is your identity, you, it are redu is reduced to the information pattern in your brain. So you survive as long as certain information patterns are conserved, okay? So radical enhancements and mind uploading pose a serious challenge for transhumanists regarding preserving personal identity. And don't think that I'm the only one critiquing uh, the identity problem. Even transhumanists themselves see this as a problem as materialists, and they don't think the self endures through to posthumanism, to the posthuman, that the, that the future you is not you. So I'm just telling you what I've read. <laughs> Therefore, what we want to concentrate on is their view, their patternist view of self, and that's our focus. But just so you know, historically, there's um, the soul view, which we'll talk about next week, is your essence or identity is rooted in your soul or mind understood as a non-physical entity distinct from your body? The psychological continuity view, which was John Locke's view, is your essentially your memories and your ability to reflect on yourself. Strict materialism, you're essentially the material you're made of, your body and brain, and you don't survive the death of your body. No self-view is more like Buddhism, and it's the self is an illusion. There's no underlying self or person. There's no enduring identity because there is no person. So Ray Kurzweil didn't like any of these views. And it didn't go, it, he, he wanted to be able to tell you the future you is you, right? I mean, they, they don't have much of a selling point do you get me? I mean, how are they going to persuade you if it's not you overcoming death, right? So he, the very first time he, uh, this is Ray Kurzweil, and he works for Google and the government and other stuff. But uh, the first time I read it was, ah, was in his book, The Singularity is Near. This is the first place I saw that he discusses it. And so a lot of transhumanists hold to this view. It's, 
not really like any of the historical views. I, mean, I would argue that it's very similar to the materialism view. Well, it, it, it's actually, it's a, it's a version of it, but it's not, it, it's not as severe. So the pattern, so, so let's see, so the reason why I have the quotes on this is because it's not described in any textbook. So you got it. I need to tell you what they say about it, right? So we want to do it in, in his own words. So this is the reasoning. We know that most of our cells are turned over in a matter of weeks, right? You have cell turnover. Even the neurons in our brain, which persist as distinct cells for a relatively longer time, nonetheless change all of their constituent mo molecules within a month. So your cells are changing your matter is changing okay so how do you get to this so you know where do you get enduring self if you're only your body and brain material so he says i am rather like the pattern that water makes in a stream as it rushes past the rocks in its path the actual molecules of water change every millisecond but the pattern persists for hours or even years Okay, so you got it? So he's, he's partially saying that, that it can, your pattern can persist. Mm -hmm. Would this still fall under a materialist conception? Or is the pattern no longer a material thing? It is, a, it is material. Okay. Yeah. So it's so like he says, it, it would fall under material, but it's a little different. Yeah. yeah, the pattern is rooted in material. Yeah, but it's physical, ca physically caused, caused, right? The pattern itself doesn't so, but take note of this. The pattern only exists for a while, even on normal cell turnover, okay? So, radical enha enhancements will radically change your brain pattern, is what I'm suggesting, and others too. It's not just me. Memories can be, on, on transhumanism, you might have your memories erased. Let's say you had bad childhood trauma. You could have those erased. You could even have memory enhanced enhancement. You could have, get this, Sam, brain sonar sense, echo, echolocation added to your senses. Do you like that? I thought you might like that. Okay. And, oh, Jackson, are you going to have to kill him? Oh, my gosh. Oh, my gosh. I'm so sorry for that. No, it's okay. He's an assassin. Someone get him. Did you, did you get him? Ah! This is like SEAL Team or, yeah. Good job, Jackson. They're evil. You're evil. Bread. Oh my god. <laughs> oh my god. Can we finish? Are y'all do y'all want me to just stop or do you are you are, No? Are we okay? Okay, tell me when you want to stop. What happens when the pattern's interrupted? Yes, the pattern! The pattern is not is, is terrible. Okay, so I think there's also a blurring of your pattern with the collective consciousness with peop with a collective people and with the superintelligence. So uh, I'm just saying, and actually Ray Kurzweil in the course of his, over, like I read his stuff from the beginning to recent, and he kind of changes his mind. At first he says this pattern stuff and it's, it, se it seems plausible, but then later he really gives it up. It's not that he thinks that the pattern will be, you know, not be. Well, I'm fixing to tell you. Oh, I was just curious on this conception. Um, has there been any, any, ev or any ev evidence that maybe a pattern does persist? Like well, I think, that, I think that I think I think with the in neuroscience, they can see the patterns of neuro, neuro, neurons in your brain. I know, but have they ever? Have there been any actual proof that, in fact, a pattern may persist for a singular singular person over multiple? I scales, think I think it does. It, it, think about different what things. he's saying is that, like, your mind is a pattern that your nerves are like generating effectively. 
Right. Well, that's why I'm curious whether there is a physical punishment. But there's not, the, the only way to okay. prove that really would be there's not really a good way to fully prove it, except for changing the material that is based in, or teleportation. I mean, you should be able to see the actual pattern in a brain scan. Yeah. And you can. So, but they haven't done these enhance. So I'm saying radical things. enhancements haven't been done, and I and maybe so. Then you could do uh, MRI, fMRI, functional MRI to see if the pattern, you know, changes with radical enhancements, right? I mean, it doesn't even need, this is just the question of okay, if you are the pattern, then therefore the pattern shouldn't change drastically over multiple brain scans. Otherwise. The pattern I mean, theory just doesn't work. Right, and that's why we're saying it just has to do with the with whether you think the radical enhancements have a have an effect on your pattern. But let's oh. let's go on because there's more than just him. Uh, Nick Bostrom is the um, he's at Oxford, and I think his his institute there is called the Future Future Something Institute. But he's also the co-founder of Humanity Plus, which is the global transhumanist um, organization. <clears throat> so this is what he says about the same thing, and he's in line with Ray Kurzweil. Uploading is the process of transferring an intellect from a biological brain to a computer. A widely accepted position among transhumanists is that you survive so long as certain information patterns are conserved, such as your memories, values, attitudes, and emotional dispositions, and so long as there is causal continuity so that earlier stages of yourself help determine later stages of yourself. Okay, wait for it. For the continuation of personhood on this view, it matters little, little whether you are implemented on a silicon chip inside a computer or in that gray cheesy lump inside your skull. Assuming both implementations are conscious. So for Nick, I would say his little hiccup <laughs> is the same as Ray's, Kurzweil's, but he assumes consciousness can be transferred to a non-biological machine. And I think if our previous arguments hold, this, is a pro this would be not metaphysically possible. So let me, do one, let me say one more thing about this. And this is something uh, Nick and Ray Kurzweil say. Whole brain emulation is the gradual replacement of all the organic neurons in your brain with artificial synthetic neurons. The non-biological brain created through this scenario can be copied and backed up with more copies. So this is what Ray Kurzweil says about that. It's not true that the copy is not you. It is you. It's just that there are now two or more of you. Okay, that's a, that, is a problem for enduring self and identity, right? Because really, there's only one person that can be Bob. Remember Bob? And it's the original. So it's, it's kind of absurd. It's an absurdity that happens with transhumanism when they get into this stage of it, that you've got many copies that are you, okay? But not everyone, not every transhumanist agrees with Ray and Nick. So Ben Gertzel, he's the chairman of the board of Humanity Plus. He's the AGI researcher, he's a really smart guy. He says personal identity will pretty much become obsolete for him. He's not worried, he, he doesn't really care about it. Advances in technology will lead to the obsolesc obsolescence of many of the most familiar features of our, of our inner lives like how we conceive of ourselves, our feeling of free will, the sense that we have a consciousness that's sharply distinct from the world around us, and the sense that we have our mind and awareness is within us rather than entwined in the interactions with other minds in the external environment. So he's not, he didn't get his panties in a wad about identity. And he doesn't think transhumanists should be promoting that the future you is you. Okay, he's just, I like him because he's honest, right? He's just saying, look, it's not about, it's not gonna be about that. Um, James Hughes is the same way, and he runs the um, online journal for um, transhumanism. 
And he's, he's more of a Buddhist. So he says, once technology gives us control over our, our memory, cognition, and personality, we'll abandon our Western view of individuality for new forms of collective identity. Okay? So he's pretty honest, too. And they're at odds with Ray Kurzweil. But they all agree, you know, they're all family. But on identity, some of them are concerned that we think that the future you is you, and some think that they could, you could just let that go. It feels like few of them are the same, like imagining themselves as individual AI as all the others are imagining themselves as, uh, as collective AI. Yeah, and James Hughes is definitely a Buddhist, and he would say that. So, so transhumanists assume that since identity endure, endures through natural changes in the brain, then identity will endure through radical changes. Okay, you like my, you like my, are you smiling at my picture, Jackson? No? Huh? I don't know, I just like that picture. Um, <laughs> radical enhancements like uploading and all the other stuff we talked about far exceed natural processes, which are not compatible, I don't think we could say, with the survival of identity. And transhumanism's trajectory of enhancement is likely what Susan Schneider, and she's a transhumanist, Susan Schneider says, it's likely an alluring path to suicide. So she would say the post-human you is likely not you. Which I think is weird because the selling point is that you will overcome death, right? But you're going to kill yourself, so, right? So I, I have these... Uh, metaphors that I use for it. And so becoming post-human to me means the abolition of you. It's like kicking away the ladder you climbed to become post-human. You're kicking away your humanity. Or it's like cutting off the branch on which you're sitting or burning the ships that brought you. I don't know. I, those stick in my mind. They might stick in yours. So the takeaways are... Um, Transhumanism doesn't have an adequate account or philosophy of human persons. So we have good reasons to reject their enhancement strategy to become post-human because it wouldn't be good for hu our human flourishing, wouldn't be good for us. And next week, we'll investigate the Christian view of human persons. So, and, and so we're already past time, but you know, the meeting's almost over. And then someone asked the question. <laughs> I knew we would probably be over. We started late anyway. Uh, we did start late. I'm sorry. So clarification questions or questions? Does identity matter? Does your enduring self, it's sense of, uh, does, so does that you have a self? Ship? What? Like DC we'll... ship, the, the replacement is the same ship in transhumanism? No, it's no, not. No, no, it's no I would say it's some, not. Some are, some right. Are, right. So that's an argument. So it's the ship of Theseus, which is. I, I have a. About the ship of Theseus. Yeah. I don't think I have time to explain oh. if anyone's unfamiliar. Uh, my, my answer is that if you took all of the old pieces of the original ship and then you rebuilt the original ship, then you would simply have two ships of Theseus because the relevant property of, of the ships is seaworthiness and ownership. So, it's, so then as far as human identity, it's a question of what is the relevant... Uh, what is the relevant factor? Um, what is the right. source, the seat of identity? Yeah, and I right. think uh, uh, the Christian answer would probably be something along with being made in the image of God as an individual, as um, as part of creation. Um, or that, yeah. So people create prime and matter combined with form. Or Aristotelian form and matter, right? Ben, did you have a question? Oh, yeah. Um, so this may be a next week question, so feel free to say that. But all these problems of identity also hold for the Christian view of eternal life. Um, so, you know, we die, um, we go to heaven, and even after the resurrection of the body, you can still come up with really powerful identity objections um, to the fact that, you know, we've That the future you isn't you? Right. And that this, this undermines. You mean if you don't have a soul? Um, even on some views of like an Aristotelian view of soul and body, where the soul is so integrated into the body, they're not, you know, it is the form of the body. When the body is pretty different, you know, do you have the, a different soul? Even? Um, 
So what would you say in general to those? So it's not totally cases? different, right? Right. So what? Um, it's just a, an incorruptible body. So wouldn't that be a very radical shift, though, just as we've described? Yeah, but your soul, the soul, the, the enduring self of your soul that's kept together in the disembodied state, obviously is not, um, it's not, um, it's not who we are. We're not our soul. We're soul and body, right? So ultimately, we get that. We, we have an embodiment. But um, are you saying... So the identity is rooted in your soul. Yeah, so if you, I think my, my difficulty is, and this is probably a better question for next week, is just how that plays out with saying you're you know, how you have the soul being the I think we, you know, I'm, y'all need to pray for me because I don't have that presentation all mapped out. But I am going to do, an, it's, not, it's not the total Aristotelian view. It's more like Ed Fazer's or J.P. Moreland's, which is quasi-Aristotelian. And I, I think we will go over their view. Yeah. yeah. More, you know, probably better. I I'm, I'm tend toward that rather than some sort of neo-Cartesian view.